Not the... A hundred thousand guests have been invited to Beijing celebrations. They'll be watching events in a very tidy square. The sightseers have been moved out, the security moved in. At all times sensitive about public order, the Chinese authorities want nothing to ruffle an immaculate reunification. But surrounding these traditional grand-scale events in Tiananmen Square, the capital is no longer a drab sprawl of communism. In a decade's economic surge, Beijing has embraced advertising and consumerism and spawned traffic jams and lots of hamburger outlets. The mobile phone is the accessory, and there are pockets of shiny, expensive shopping arcades, which are a taste of the Hong Kong lifestyle. And the colony's favorite pursuits have made a tentative appearance here. Not quite the glamour of Hong Kong's Happy Valley race course, but there's much potential at the dusty track outside Beijing. And the multi-million dollar gambling industry in Hong Kong is matched by a modest flutter known as guessing the winner in China. Gambling and shopping may easily make inroads into life here, but whether, after reunification, Hong Kong's independent thought and democratic actions have similar impact is very open to question. For along with the authorities' repudiation of Western-style democracy, there is at least skepticism amongst the young who see themselves pursuing a Chinese way. Uh, and we have own democracy and Western people have their own. Uh, and I think uh, both of us have their advantage and a disadvantage. We must uh, study the advantage of the Western people's democracy and I think we will have our own way to, um, to, govern, to government our country. The Chinese are facing reunification, confident in their system, but heading for their celebration, wearing the emblems of Hong Kong consumerism. Kate Aidy, BBC News, Beijing. And Emily Lau is one of Hong Kong's most prominent campaigners for democracy. She's with me now. Um, a lot of people who've seen the British ceremonies here in Hong Kong, they're, they're pretty much finished now, um, will have been moved by them, particularly people watching back in Britain. Has Britain anything to be proud of on this day? Yes, there are certain things that we cherish, like the rule of law, civil liberties. All these things, of course, have been underpinned by the democracy in the United Kingdom. But now, at the stroke of midnight, I feel like Cinderella, because I'm going to be completely out of a job, no longer an elected politician. And then China has appointed a provisional council to replace us. So all of the Hong Kong people would be disenfranchised. Is that the proud legacy of Britain? The people who are taking over here say you will still be free. Well, I'm not so sure. I hope so. One of our greatest fear is the possibility of losing our freedoms. Freedoms that we've enjoyed under British rule. But the trouble with the British legacy is we are now faced with deep uncertainty. And the, the nasty thought is if anything should go wrong here, Britain would not lift a finger to help us. Isn't this actually the case, that what you will get is a sort of limited freedom? You'll be able to say pretty much what you like about Hong Kong and its business and the outside world, but you certainly won't be able to say what you like uh, about China and its affairs. Um, is that going to hold? I'm not so sure. I think you're being a bit optimistic. I always like to talk about self-determination and how disgraceful Britain and China have been in denying us that right. In future, we're going to have a law on secession. Anybody who talked about that seceding from China should be thrown into jail. So I'm not so sure that we will have limited freedoms, as and you it, say. And if people are thrown into jail, you're saying there is simply nothing that Britain can or will do? Yes, I think Britain is very interested in trade. After all, that was why Hong Kong was founded. We mustn't forget that. Money, trade, contracts. Michael Heseltine led so many big delegations to China. And we know they're not, they're not interested in looking after our welfare. Emily Lau with a crack of thunder and lightning outside us, or possibly the beginning of the fireworks. We'll see in just a moment or two. I think it was probably the fireworks. We will hand you from Hong Kong back to uh, Edward Sturton in London for the moment. Members of a gang that carried out a huge drug smuggling operation are being sentenced at Bristol Crown Court today. Fourteen people were found guilty in a series of trials following a complex surveillance operation carried out by customs officers. Until now, there's been a ban on reporting the cases. The trials held for security reasons here at Bristol Crown Court are the culmination of one of the most extensive investigations ever undertaken by Britain's customs officers. 
more than £60 million worth of drugs were seized and 44 people arrested, including several major criminals specifically targeted by customs. Foremost amongst them was Tony White, allegedly involved in 1984 in the Brinksmat robbery when £26 million was taken. Over a period of 18 months, customs officers took thousands of surveillance photos of the conspirators, meeting in restaurants, in pubs and on street corners. It was here at Dover that the first arrests were made in September 1994. Customs stopped a van which had come from France, loaded with drink, so it appeared it had been on a cheap booze run. But hidden under the van's false floor were 22 kilos of cocaine. On the same day, a lorry which had travelled from Gibraltar to Portsmouth was stopped. Hidden in the spare wheel was a quarter of a million pounds worth of cannabis. The arrests were coordinated from here at Customs House in London, headquarters of the investigation. Officers then learned more about a much bigger smuggling operation involving cocaine with a street value of nearly 40 million pounds coming from South America. This man, Brian Duran, was the mastermind. A Glasgow criminal, he'd been involved in drugs for many years, living for a time in South America, in Colombia. He had meetings with White, here on the left, who helped finance the deal. This was the boat used in the cocaine smuggling operation, a 50-foot catamaran called the Frugal, fitted out with sophisticated technical and communications equipment. Customs tracked it to the West Indies, to St. Lucia. The Frugal sailed back to England in January last year to Pevensey Bay in East Sussex, loaded with cocaine. As it sailed up the channel in the middle of the night, it was shadowed on radar by customs officers on board cutters. But their attempt to arrest the smugglers was hampered by very bad weather. The cocaine in bales had already been taken ashore, but it was found abandoned, along with a mobile phone which had received calls from the boat. Hours later, at this London address, customs swooped, arresting the main conspirators. The longest ever operation in customs history was over. At Bristol, a total of 14 are now awaiting sentencing for their parts in the various smuggling operations. Graham McLagan, BBC News. The High Court has heard that a man and a woman with a string of convictions for abusing children were left with nowhere to hide after police in Wales passed on information about them. Their legal challenge to the police action is being seen as a test case on whether the public have the right to know about paedophiles in order to protect other children. The court was told that the couple, known only as AB and CD, were forced to move four times in six months after local people found out that they'd each received long prison sentences for a series of sex offences against children. The final move was from a caravan site in North Wales, after the police showed the owner press cuttings relating to their past. They're now living in a lay-by. The couple's lawyers claim that decision by North Wales Police amounted to encouraging harassment and should be declared illegal. Stephen Solly QC, representing the couple, told the Lord Chief Justice the police had come close to turning his clients into outlaws with nowhere to run and nowhere to hide. He argued that just as no one should be above the law, no one should be below it either. It was, said Mr Solly, a misuse of police power, unjustifiable, unreasonable and unlawful. North Wales police deny they acted unlawfully. The outcome of the case is being watched carefully by the Home Office, which is currently drawing up guidelines on who should have access to information on the new paedophile register. Tim Hirsch, BBC News, at the High Court. The government has confirmed that radioactive waste was dumped in the sea just six miles off the Scottish coast, despite earlier denials. The Minister of Agriculture will tell Parliament tomorrow that low-level waste was dropped in the Beaufort Dyke, which lies between Scotland and Northern Ireland. Off the rugged coast of southwest Scotland, close to busy ferry and shipping lanes, lies the biggest ammunition dump in Western Europe. More than a million tonnes of World War II and other weapons have been discarded on the seabed. The government has long insisted that no nuclear arms or waste had been left here too. Today they admitted they were wrong. The dump, six miles off an area of the Scottish coast popular with tourists, is known as Beaufort Dyke. Locals are alarmed at the new discovery. 
We're absolutely horrified. We already know there was a severe problem with a cocktail of high explosive uh, chemicals and phosphorus down in the Irish Sea in Beaufort Dyke. Now to cap it all, we find we've got nuclear waste as well. So the people of South West Scotland are going to be very concerned indeed about this latest revelation. For years, proof of an ammunition dump has long been clear. Thousands of dangerous incendiaries have been washed up on shore. Now it's emerged the dump included at least two tonnes of low-level commercial nuclear waste from paints and clocks. The evidence emerged through the discovery of old documents like these. But scientists fear there could be more nuclear waste there. The, the possible implication is that there are still potential areas in the uh, Beaufort's Dyke area which could be contaminated with materials from uh, the dumped ammunition, which the, the results so far haven't shown up. The coast is constantly monitored by naval arms disposal teams. The government says the level of radiation remains low and is not a threat either to people or to fish in the Irish Sea. But locals both in Ireland and Scotland want a full investigation to see if the nuclear waste can be removed. Margaret Gilmore, BBC News. Doctors at the British Medical Association's annual conference have rejected a call for charges to be introduced for basic NHS services. Some doctors at the conference in Edinburgh had claimed charges were needed to ensure proper funding for the NHS. Consultations like this might cost £10 a time if doctors like Jonathan Regler got their way. The Buckinghamshire GP believes patients who can afford it should contribute more to the cost of the NHS. It will make people think twice about whether they really need to go and see their doctor. If they don't need to see their doctor and they decide that, then it'll mean that the doctor can concentrate on the care of someone who does need their attention. And finally, it will raise money for a cash-strapped service. But in today's debate, the BMA chairman said he was appalled by the thought of charging patients because this would deter them from seeking medical help. We need a strategy to achieve a realistic level of funding for the NHS, which should be provided unequivocally and explicitly from public funds. We welcome the promised review of sources of funding, but we warn against the introduction of new charges. Doctors supported his call for an extra billion pounds a year to be spent on the NHS. But with the government having ruled out income tax increases, they realise they're unlikely to get it. Even so, doctors said charging patients was not the answer. As an inner city GP, I firmly believe that no financial barrier should come between my general medical services and my patients, ever. The message to the government from today's debate was unequivocal. New patient charges would drive a stake through the heart of the NHS and doctors would fight their introduction all the way. Fergus Walsh, BBC News, Edinburgh. The number two seed, Monica Selesh, has been knocked out of the Wimbledon Championships. She's been bit beaten by France's Sandrine Testud in the third round by two sets to one. Selesh, who won the opening set 6-love, then lost the next 6-4 before going down 8-6 in the deciding set. Back now to Hong Kong, where the ceremonies leading up to the transfer of power are in full swing. Justin Webb is there. Edward, I can confirm that the British firework display has well and truly began, begun here. It uh, began about 10 minutes or so ago. There you can see it in all its glory. Firework display in Hong Kong's Western Harbour. Release of energy after a day of uh, solemn and sometimes emotional ceremony. A day of rain-soaked ceremony as well, and you can see the clouds there that the uh, fireworks are illuminating. Now, a small contingent of Chinese troops is already stationed here in Hong Kong, but the first of the larger deployments will come across the border in less than an hour's time. And our correspondent, Jeremy Cook, is at the border now. And Jeremy, tell us what the form is, what is intended to happen. Well, Justin, what I can tell you is that it's happening right now. If you look over my shoulder, you will see the coaches and military vehicles which are carrying the first of these 509 People's Liberation Army troops. They have arrived in Hong Kong. They're going through some formalities here before they move down into the territories, into Hong Kong proper, where they will take up positions in former British barracks. So just to confirm, they have actually arrived slightly early? They have arrived slightly early. Uh, they were expected uh, in around 20 minutes' time. But here they are. Uh, they have crossed... I can tell you officially into uh, Hong Kong territory. 
Uh, that was something uh, which was obviously uh, a point of negotiation uh, between the British and Chinese authorities. The British that, uh, had hoped that they would uh, hang back a little bit, but clearly the uh, Chinese authorities have decided that it is time to take up the reins of power, no. even if it does seem a little early. Now, the commanders of these troops have told them very firmly, haven't they, they that they must behave. They have indeed. They've been on something of a public relations offensive even before they got here, Justin. I mean, they've been learning English. We've seen uh, footage of them uh, in class asking politely each other to show them identification documents, that kind of thing. They have been told to behave. The People's Liberation, does have, uh, People's Liberation Army does have some reputation for corruption, but we are told these are elite troops and that they will be on their best behavior in Hong Kong. And they're going straight to barracks. It's not intended that they patrol the streets straight to barracks at the moment. In fact, their future role here is less than certain at the moment. Of course, we have the Hong Kong police force, which will continue in its role, but I'm sure we'll see these troops patrolling the border. The Chinese want this to remain a hard border. It is one country, two systems. They don't want those two systems to mix. Jeremy Cook at the border between China and Hong Kong. Thank you very much. And as the firework display continues behind me, majority of the people of Hong Kong have not, of course, been involved in these official ceremonies, but everyone here is enjoying a five-day public holiday. Our foreign affairs correspondent Ben Brown has spent the day with one family determined to mark the occasion. This is a day for the ordinary people of Hong Kong, people like the Chan family, just as much as it's a day for princes, prime ministers and presidents. The Chans took a short ferry ride from Kowloon to the heart of Hong Kong to see all the pomp and pageantry. If there is a typical family here, then it's the Chans. Kwok K. Chan is a civil engineer, his wife Ming Ching a teacher. Together they earn an average income, they live in an average house. And today they wanted to bring their two children to bear witness to a far from average moment in history, a moment that will change all of their lives. Today is a historical day, so um, as a parent, uh, I think uh, I bring along my child, uh, children to here to uh, celebrate this great day. Uh, so let them, they will remember this day, uh, the great day of we Chinese. The torrential downpour has somewhat spoilt the Chan's day out, but still they take happy snaps of history and of the last British troops here swimming in the rain. Mrs. Chan was born in China, and so for this family at least, reunification is something to celebrate, not to mourn. I don't think there will be something worse. Yeah. And in fact, you can see China's Chinese leader already promised to keep Hong Kong going, to keep Hong Kong as good as well. So I don't see any problem in the future. Not only rain, but roadblocks too kept the Chan some way from the ceremonials. But what they saw and heard still made their day. Around the world, tens of millions of people are watching this handover on television. The Chan family know how lucky they are to be able to see it for themselves, and they wouldn't have missed it for the world. It is, they say, history right in front of their eyes. Ben Brown, BBC News, Hong Kong. Now, the handover itself will take place at 5 o'clock British time, midnight here, at the newly built convention centre on the harbour front. Asia correspondent Fergal Keane is down there now. Um, Fergal, is this the smooth transfer of power that people hope for? I think it is. I mean, it's certainly a very loud transfer of power at the moment behind me with the fireworks still going on. Um, so far, though, it has been a day without incident, and I think everybody, both British and Chinese, will be pleased by that. I think the news that we're hearing now, though, that the Chinese troops are actually coming into Hong Kong at the border point is interesting. It does indicate, I think, the arrival of these convoys of soldiers and lorries. It indicates that China is very determined to stamp its sovereignty on Hong Kong as quickly as possible. It's a very, uh, very early move in by the BLA. And don't forget that in a few hours more, we're going to see something like 4,000 troops coming in. Presumably, though, the people of Hong Kong will take some satisfaction from the fact that those troops have been warned very severely by their commanders that they must behave. I think that's right, and I think, you know, there is a vast amount of foreign journalists here, cameras at the moment. The Chinese won't want incidents happening in front of them. Uh, the great feeling, I think, here today is one of celebration. I mean, you can, uh, you can feel it. It's palpable here on the harbour front with the fireworks going off behind me. Also, I should say, a sense for British people of echoes of greatness past. Um, Virgil, are we going to see in the immediate future, do you think, any kind of challenge 
um, from those who want a greater degree of democracy here, for those who've been campaigning for democracy, any kind of challenge to the new authorities? I think the challenge will start at midnight when people uh, occupy the Legislative Council building to make a protest. That's definitely going to happen. I think, though, that the possibility of a massive Tiananmen Square-style protest is at the moment unlikely. It all depends how the Chinese handle things. If they're sensible, if they allow democracy to go ahead, then there won't be problems. But if they clamp down, the Chinese people in Hong Kong won't accept that. Um, there have been diplomatic kerfuffles, there have been last minute toing and froing, there's been a feeling that um, this, that the ceremonies this evening might be boycotted, that there might be difficulties. At the end of the day, uh, just to confirm in the, in the last few moments of the programme, that it looks as if the ceremonies this evening are going to go off pretty much uh, as planned. They will. I mean, look, there will be a, a, a marginal British boycott, a token boycott by uh, ministers, but the general feeling is that everybody wants to make this work. And Britain's Foreign Secretary Robin Cook said, we need a stable relationship with China. That's the message of the day. Fergal Keane down there by the Western Harbour. Thank you very much. And that is just about all we have time for from both uh, London and from Hong Kong. Goodbye. Good afternoon. From the warm rain of Hong Kong, back to reality. It's only just July, nearly, so of course the rain falling here during our summer is of a rather colder variety. Indeed, the weather in Lincolnshire and now probably in North Yorkshire as well as the East Riding is probably like winter rather than summer. Certainly it's only about 10 degrees and the rain has been falling to give 